Welcome, everyone, to the Most Notorious Podcast. I'm Eric Rivenis, and I appreciate you joining me today for another true crime history episode. A quick mention for those fans of my show who happen to be in the Twin Cities, Minneapolis and St. Paul, for those not familiar with my frozen neck of the woods. The book launch for Dirty Doc Games and the Scandal That Shook Minneapolis is on April 12th, 7 p.m. at the Mill City Museum in Minneapolis. I'll be doing a brief presentation, and books will be available for both sale and autographs. It's also available for pre-order now and officially available on April 1st. I'd love to meet you in person, so please put it on your calendar and swing by. So on to the show. My guest is Ellen Polson. If you recognize her name, it's because she did a two-part interview a while back about the many women of John Dillinger, which was highly entertaining, and I'm so glad she's back today, this time to chat about her book, entitled The Case Against Lucky Luciano, New York's Most Sensational Vice Trial. It's a pleasure, as always, to have you on. Thank you. Thank you, Eric. So Charles Lucky Luciano is such a compelling figure in the history of American crime. How did you become inspired to author a book about him? Well, this is this story is almost unbelievable. I was doing a talk in... Um, in a historical society about John Dillinger, who was the subject of an earlier book, and two people in the audience got into a fight over who was the tougher gangster, John Dillinger or Lucky Luciano. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, I'm helplessly standing there while these two men are going at it verbally, and I decided that uh, th- there's something to this. Let me find out something about Luciano. And uh, I read a book by um, Lacey, his name was, and it was um, actually a book about Meyer Lansky, and it mentioned that Luciano had been the subject of a, vi- of a sensational vice trial in the 1930s. And because the uh, niche that I've gotten myself into with 1930s crime quite a bit is the untold story of the women. I thought that that would make an interesting story, a prostitution trial involving a major underworld figure. And because I live in New York, it was easy for me to research it. Down in the New York City Municipal Archives, there are trial boxes um, that are accessible to researchers. And the wonderful archivists at the New York City Municipal Archives made it easy for me to access the boxes. And I call it my subway book because I used to go in uh, by subway every day and do my research. So uh, that's how that book came about, (laughs) by two old men getting into a fight. (laughs) 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 Who was a tougher gangster? (laughs) How long did it take you to put the book together? That book went fast for me. I would say, trying to remember, maybe three years, four years. I average, I average between eight and fifteen years for my other books, which is something that I'm trying to streamline. But uh, that went pretty fast. You know, you say that in hindsight, though. I think other writers might agree that after something is completed, you almost don't remember doing it. It's like having a baby. You don't really remember what you went through. Right. (laughs) And and I I wouldn't know the baby part, but (laughs) I can only imagine. (laughs) Right. Probably a lot of the guys who are into true crime wouldn't relate to that statement that I just made. But I think writers might relate to the fact that once the book is out there, you don't really remember how much sweat and blood went into it. Right, right. Yeah. I actually did an episode a few weeks ago about New York City in the 1890s when Tammany Hall was battling reformists, Teddy Roosevelt was police commissioner, and your book takes place in New York City, of course, as well, but about 40 years later. What was the climate of crime when your story takes place? Well, Tammany Hall was still in existence in the 1930s, for one thing. So you just mentioned Tammany Hall. It was the tail end of it because Fiorello LaGuardia was coming in in 1936 as a reform mayor who tried to push out all those um, 
crime friendly aspects of Tammany Hall and because they were the Democrats they were um, aligned with all of the the Democratic politicians were all aligned with organized crime so that was still very much happening in the 1930s and every big um, gangster of that period had politicians that were working side by side with them uh, from Dutch Schultz in Harlem and the Bronx to uh, the Bugs Meyer mob and L- Lucky Luciano on the Lower East Side. It was all about which politicians you had in your pocket. The The crime scene in the early 1930s in New York City was pretty convoluted, very regional, although not as regional, say, as a city like Chicago. With Chicago, everything was almost factioned off according to streets and uh, near West Side and far west and near north. Thank goodness New York City wasn't that complicated because it's easier to understand. But you had um, basically the triangle between the uh, north, which was the Bronx and Harlem, down into Brooklyn, which was... um, Aspects of the Capone mob were down in Brooklyn, and they would jetty back and forth between Chicago and Brooklyn. And then you had the people on the Lower East Side who were more closely aligned with Lucky Luciano. Interesting. So it was a large, like a triangular, triangular area. Could you talk about these gangsters individually? A little background on... Dutch Schultz, for instance. Who who was he, and what was his territory? There were rogue gangsters. I mean, that's my word, and not everybody would agree with that, but people like Dutch Schultz were more or less at odds with what you want to call organized crime factions or maybe more what we tend to think of today as mafia you know, with the roots and the Sicilians and the Italian mobs. Dutch Schultz came up against those mobs quite a bit. He was a a um, Bronx-based mobster who went after the control of the Harlem policy racket. Now, the Harlem policy racket was run by African-Americans, in particular, a woman named Stephanie St. Clair, who was also known as Madam Queen. And um, I guess you've heard of her lieutenant, Bumpy Johnson, who was more or less a, an enforcer, Ellsworth Bumpy Johnson. And uh, Dutch Schultz moved in to take over the policy from the African Americans and a lot of, uh, a large group of Hispanics up from places like Cuba, uh, places in Central America that were sending immigrants up at that time into New York City. So the Hispanics and the African Americans got pushed out. They were called policy bankers. They were pushed out by Dutch Schultz as he, uh, as he took over, but as he gained power and control, he made a lot of enemies among what I what I'll call the Italian mobs. And when I say the Italian mobs, by nineteen thirty five when Schultz was killed, they weren't only Italians. After Luciano um took gained power in New York, he consolidated the Italian mob with with the um, a lot of Jewish gangsters. So when I say Italian, it was actually a blend of Jewish and Italian, some Irish, and um, when Dutch Schultz gained too much power in 1935, he started to announce that he was going to kill a prosecutor by the name of Thomas E. Dewey. And Thomas E. Dewey was a prosecutor who was making a name for himself in New York by going after the mob. When people like Lucky Luciano, the Jewish gangster, Maya Lansky, when they learned of this, they decided that Schultz had to go. So Schultz was murdered in um, a place in Newark called the Palace Chop House, and he was murdered by hired guns um, in the group murder from the group Murder Incorporated. So 
that was the end of Dutch Schultz. And uh, I don't think anybody was sorry to see him go because he was not, at that point, he was not a popular person in organized crime. And when uh, he was dying in the hospital, the uh, African-American boss, Madame St. Clair, actually sent him a telegram that said, as ye sow, so ye shall reap. And uh, so that was what happened to him. So could you could you remind me of, of Schultz's ethnicity? He was a German, Flegenhammer, Arnold Flegenhammer. So you're saying that unlike a lot of the gangs, joined together by their culture, ethnicity, etc., Schultz was actually able to band together an organization made up of of lots of different groups of people. Yes, and he got um, a lot of publicity. There were others that were. Um, more or less rogue, there was Jack Legs Diamond. That, these are people that everybody's heard of, especially New Yorkers, but no, nobody, the average person probably doesn't know a whole lot about what they did. But um, Jack Legs Diamond was another one of these rogues who was involved on, a, on certain levels with Lucky Luciano. But he, too, became so unpopular with the underworld that by 1931, he was, he was killed. He was uh, called the Clay Pigeon because there were so many attempts on his life, he, and they, he just kept on ticking. <laughs> so that they finally got him in 1931. He had been linked to Luciano on a, a transatlantic flight, I'm sorry, he had been linked to Luciano on a transatlantic uh, ship voyage to try to arrange a drug deal um, that was backed by Arnold Rothstein. So his roots went pretty deep into the 1920 Arnold Rothstein empire. And um, when Rothstein was killed, People like Luciano and Lakes Diamond were considered suspects, but not for long, because there was uh, absolutely nothing they could point to to say that they were involved in it. A couple of questions I want to ask, and, and I'd like to back up briefly. You mentioned Schultz moving in and taking over policy rackets. Can you explain what policy rackets are? Um, I mean, I remember, because I grew up in Brooklyn, I remember, hey, I hit the number, you know, there was always somebody who hit the number. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, what that was in at the time of the Harlem uh, policy racket, policy was just another word for the number. And it was um, like a penny number that was sold by um, people on the street that were called bankers. And um, it was based on, I think it was a three-digit number, but it was based on a pretty com complicated calculation based on the racing scores at um, Hialeah Racetrack in Florida. And uh, they, they would put the numbers backwards and the last race and what the tally was, and um, that was called the policy. But the odds were also not good, so there wasn't really much of a chance of anybody getting rich from it. I, I guess like today's pick five or the lotteries that people buy every day in the, the local 7-Eleven, it was a um, run on the street. And uh, so when they say policy, they mean the numbers, a gambling racket, very low level, very street, and participated in by everybody in the neighborhood. Do you mind elaborating on Murder, Inc.? Could you give a little history on the organization? Yes. Murder, Incorporated was actually not what people comprehend as, ha as being the mafia or the words that people use, the cosa, no, you know, words like that. Murder, Incorporated was a separate entity that was formed under the uh, auspices, if I may, of um, Jewish gangsters in the neighborhood of Brownsville, which is on the uh, going toward the eastern, northeastern section of Brooklyn. 
I know the neighborhood because my father was a police officer in the 1960s in the 73rd precinct. So geographically, I do know where it was. And um, during the 1930s and 1940s, um, Lepke Bukhalter, who was uh, the only organized crime figure to later be uh, executed in the electric chair, he was um, one of the top bosses of a group of men who were hired to uh, assassinate mobsters. They were hired for underworld rubouts, and they did not work only in New York. They were they were suspects in, in um, crimes of uh, underworld murder all over the United States, and. Uh, some of them have been picked out by historians like Harry Pittsburgh, Phil Strauss, people like that who were uh, later executed for murder. Uh, quite a few of them were rounded up that way. The um, the famous Abe Rellis, Kid Twist, I think a lot of people have heard of the man who was pushed or fell out the window in the uh, Coney Island Hotel. They called him the canary who could sing but could not fly. He was a, a figure in Murder Incorporated. So I guess in a nutshell, to explain Murder Inc., it was, a, it was coined by reporters. All of these flamboyant expressions from that era were always the product of newspaper headlines. And um, it had no connection. In other words, the people involved in carrying out the uh, assignments of Murder Incorporated were not necessarily uh, what we would think of as mafioso. They were hired guns. The person who went to prison for 22 years for killing Dutch Schultz, even though it was a large conspiracy, one person went to prison for it, a guy named Charlie the Bug. <laughs> Charlie the Bug, workman who went to prison for 22 years for uh, killing Dutch Schultz. He was a, a low-level member of Murder, Inc. People who could uh, use guns, people who could uh, shoot, or more sadistically, do more sadistic. There were definitely more sadistic ways that people were killed by Murder, Incorporated. Can you talk about the origins of the mafia in New York City? Maybe I shouldn't say the mafia or organized crime. Yeah, organized crime, because I think mafia tends to, I guess in its purest definition, hails back to the Sicilians that started in actually in Patterson, New Jersey, with counterfeiting rings in the 1890s. So you know that's really that's really the, the where it started in the New York metropolitan area was actually New Jersey, but if we want to talk about people like Maya Lansky and Bugsy Siegel, they were both Jewish, and they are known primarily for a, a mob that was known as the Bugs Meyer mob, meaning Bugs Siegel and Meyer Lansky in the early 1920s, like 1920 to 1922, in bootlegging. And there was um, a very big corner in New York, a block from police headquarters, but that shouldn't surprise you. <laughs> and it was called the Curbside Liquor Exchange. And all the bootleg booze that came into uh, Manhattan came in through the Curbside Liquor Exchange. So a lot of, to, to kind of paraphrase or to tie this all up, a lot of the um, Bugsy Siegel, Maya Lansky, Lucky Luciano activities of the Prohibition era revolved around bootlegging. And, um, and towards the, the mid-20s, some of these people got involved in heroin and bringing heroin into the United States. And... Uh, that was usually involved transatlantic trips and deals, and a lot of it is said to have been backed by Arnold Rothstein. So you had a very active Jewish gangster mob 
and in uh, in the 1920s, and then Charlie Lucky Luciano, who was in the rank and file of the Italian mob under um, the boss Joe the Boss Masseria, he saw the potential in making money with people who were not Italian. And he was a close friend of Maya Lansky. And, uh, I mean, when I say friend, I don't know, uh, criminal friend, criminal associate of Maya Lansky and uh, Bugsy Siegel at that time anyway. So uh, he recognized early on the benefits of moving into multi-ethnic organized crime groups rather than the... Uh, the sterility of using only Sicilians or only people from a certain region of Italy because the Italians at that time were still very compartmentalized. But this is in New York. And things were even different in Chicago and other cities. But we're talking about New York. So your book really revolves around Luciano and his ties to the prostitution racket, right? The book is definitely focused on the prostitution racket. What was the state of prostitution in the city at the time, and how was Luciano involved? Well, before the uh, mid-1930s, prostitution in New York was more or less independently run by uh, madams who, it, who really traveled around from one apartment to another with maybe one or two girls. And when I say girls, I, I guess the... Um, Politically correct phrase would be sex workers, but I'm going to use the word girls because that's what they said in those days. And um, you had women who were, some of them worked under a booker named Nick Montana, but he was arrested and put away early on. So the independent model took over until around 1933 when a group of mobsters who called themselves a bonding combination started to take over. And the idea was that the classic, I guess, when a a mob group takes over any enterprise, right, threatening violence, fear and intimidation, and we'll offer you protection. But actually, what kind of protection are they offering? Protection against the violence that they themselves would levy on them if they did not cooperate. So they started to take over the little cottage industries that some of these madams had operated for years and years. Some of these madams were known as far back as 1912. There was one named Jenny the Factory Fisher, whether or not that was actually her real name, she was known as Jenny the Factory. She comes up in 1912 in research, and here in 1936 she was still bopping around. So why, these why the women, factory? I <laughs> I don't know. The factory is open today. I, <laughs> <laughs> okay. You know, some of these nicknames you just don't have any idea why they had them. But um, I can take a guess for Cookie Flow. <laughs> But Koki Flo, well, she was she was a notorious um, d- drug addict, Koki Flo, yes. And uh, so with fear and intimidation, and, and I mean, they would walk into these apartments and they would throw smoke bombs, or they would they hit them with lead pipes, or they uh, they took over more or less by 1934, 35. A group called the Prostitution Bonding Combination had taken over the uh, the business of uh, New York City prostitution and if i if i can just give a little um if i can just digress for a moment a lot of people listening to this i'm sure have seen boardwalk empire and they the popular concept of a prostitution brothel in that era was a big room you know lots of girls or young beautiful girls and um uh, that's not how it operated in New York. It operated like that in Chicago, in the levee under Al Capone, but it never operated like that in the mid-century in New York City. 
possibly early 1890s it did, but not by mid-century. It was really just a matter of moving from one apartment to another to another. I actually worked as a secretary in the 1980s in one of the apartments that was run by Peggy Wild. Wow. The funny thing was is that they used to say, hey, you know, this used to be a, a if I may say it, a hua house, to use the New York jargon. Hey, this used to be. And uh, and then when I was doing the research, I actually found that address and that apartment number in in the research. So it was true. So, uh, you know, they they really did um, move all around. So the now the bonding combination was run by the top two bosses were associates of Lucky Luciano. They were um, notable crime figures, Tommy the Bull, Pinocchio, and or Pinaccio, and uh, little Davy Bertillo were both known to be members of the crime family um, and associates of L- Lucky Luciano, but they honestly never really linked Lucky Luciano to that. That was a lot of... Um, a lot of uh, of a of a stretch of circumstantial and hearsay evidence, but they wanted to get him, so that was what they got him on. So before we get into that, I'd like to ask you to describe what the women's court was. The women's court is actually still downtown New York on Sixth Avenue and Tenth Street. Anyone visiting New York City as a as a visitor, a tourist should uh, should go there because now it's a library and it's phenomenal to walk in there. I mean, it on the inside there's winding staircases, there's there's big rooms with uh, all kinds of brickwork and you can you can really imagine what it was like at the time that it was a um facility used to house women who were arrested for sex related crimes. It's very hard to imagine this in today's world. Women who were picked up for prostitution did not, who did not have the bail money would end up there for long periods of time, uh, in, in the back, which was the women's house of detention, which used to be housed behind it. So, to make a long story short, today it is known as the Jefferson Library, a branch of the New York City Public Library System on 6th Avenue and 8th Street, 10th Street. In, in the era of the 1920s and 30s, it was used for women who were arrested for sex-related crimes. People like Mae West were arrested and brought there because she was starring in a Broadway show that was considered lewd. Uh, You have to imagine a much different climate of um, morality that existed in those days. Across the street from the women's court stood a series of small storefront buildings. They're still there today in exactly the same form. These were where the bail bondsmen hung out. Now, they were a shady bunch of characters who were in league with the mob and who were in league with the madams. So once the madams agreed to join the combination that I referred to before, which was the overlords, the mobs taking over prostitution, any girl arrested had her bail posted, and she was able to uh, to walk in and out, a revolving door. So that was more or less what the women's court was. It was a facility designed only for women caught in uh, the act. You've got such great characters in your book, and one of them, he belonged to the combination, was named Ralph the Pimp Liquori. Ralph the Pimp Liquori. <laughs> <laughs> Don't you love that the picture of him with the big swollen lip? <laughs> <laughs> I did. I loved Ralph it. The Pimp. Yeah, he was um he was another one of those uh really bad guys who uh, ex- you know exhibited a lot of um uh, violence towards women including his girlfriend who her name was Nancy Presser and uh 
violence against the madams and the prostitutes. And the um, amazing thing about all of these men is that they were married. They were married, and they had wives and they had families completely outside of this <laughs> dirty thing they were involved in. Yeah, right. Right? Crazy. They were all married. The wives crying in the courtroom and all this. Quite a show, huh? It seems like it was quite the sensational trial. Yeah. So I want to ask you about the circumstances that led to the trial to begin with. Who was after Luciano? And why did they decide on prostitution? I mean, of all of the rackets I'm sure he was he was dabbling in, what made prostitution the one that prosecutors really thought they could get him on? Okay, um, that's kind of a two part question: who and how, right? So I'll sure. I'll deal with the first part of the question. Thomas E. Dewey was as as readers or as listeners may know if they're old enough to remember. He later ran for governor He lay, of New York State. He later ran, I think, as a nominee for uh, president of the United States. So in this early period of his career, the early 1930s, he was a reform-oriented prosecutor who wanted probably to make a name for himself in the way that J. Edgar Hoover was making a name for himself in Washington, D.C. with the uh, with the 1930s desperados. You know, you associate Hoover with John Dillinger and Babyface Nelson and Pretty Boy Floyd. Thomas E. Dewey was interested in doing the same thing on a different scale in New York City. And no one had anything on Luciano. He was, throughout his entire life, by the way, not just in that era, a very slippery uh, man. He There's nothing on him. Nobody ever had anything on him. I mean, there were a few drug busts in the early 20s where he was arrested for possession, served a little bit of time here or there, some truancy, boys' schools, nobody ever got anything on him of any value. So it came to uh, Dewey's attention in a, in a roundabout way that the prostitution industry had a lot of vulnerable women and other people involved in it. He learned of this through a groundbreaking, in my opinion, historical African-American woman who was working in the women's court named Eunice Carter. And she was um, a future district attorney under his staff. And uh, she brought it to his attention that, you know, there there's so many uh, women coming through here and, and somebody, and that there's a, there's a mob behind it. And Dewey put two and two together and decided that prostitutes, many of whom were, were addicted to hard narcotics, could be manipulated. So they, they staged the famous arrest of February 2nd, 1936. They arrested a hundred prostitutes in one night. Now, he made it clear, Thomas E. Dewey, to the press that he was not interested in prosecuting women for sex crimes. I guess he didn't want to be seen like a rube or, uh, uh, you know, a right wing, uh, sex reformer, but he wanted to be seen as a New Yorker, you know, a guy with sophistication. So he made it clear that he wasn't prosecuting anybody for sex crime, but behind the scenes, the drug addicts were thrown into the women's house of detention without a cure. By the couple of days into the uh, cold turkey, they would go in and say, "Here's here's your fix, but you have to you have to testify for us." The other thing they did a lot of like women who were closely aligned with with boyfriends or pimps would carry the guns for them as they were arrested 
with a gun, then it was a Sullivan law violation. In New York City, a Sullivan law violation carried three to seven years. That meant for possession of an illegal unregistered firearm. So he would go in and say, you know, you're looking at seven years for the for firearm, or you're looking at uh, a term for possession or, or this and that. So by threatening them with what he had on them, he was able to create a kind of um, little club of women who were now going to become material witnesses in the trial against Lucky Luciano. All they had to do was agree to say that they'd heard of him. I mean, ha- it, it was so um, it was so abstract, but the testimony always revolved around what somebody heard. Oh, Charlie Lucky said he's going to turn us into the AMP. He's going to unite everybody like a chain store. That was what one person testified, but she wasn't there to hear it herself. It was hearsay. So was there was hearsay. no evidence. There was no real evidence. It was, but what he did, Dewey was a very smart. He was a smart prosecutor. He did something that was revolutionary for its day, and it kind of was a precursor to what we know as um, today as the RICO laws, racketeering influenced. Um, organized crime laws where they would bring together groups of mobsters into court and try them together. He did that in 1936 under a law that the New York legislature pulled together very quickly called the Joinder Law, which meant he tried Lucky Luciana with a, with a lot of the other guys that were running that prostitution ring. Now, the other guys... Like like you mentioned, Ralph, the pimp Ligori with the big sore on his mouth. They were disgusting. They had no charisma. So here's Luciano, who had charisma, who was well-dressed, who claimed he learned his manners from Arnold Rothstein 10 years earlier. You had him in a, in a dock with, uh, with a bunch of bumps. So the jury didn't really see him as any different. As from his co-defendants. So there was a lot of subtle manipulation that went into that trial with a judge also who was very sympathetic to the prosecution. So there were a lot of things that ha- went on there which would categorize it as a trial that was not really a fair trial. But <laughs> listen, we could we could talk about a lot of the trials of the 20th century that people would say were not fair trials, Right. We could talk about a lot of them, but I think that uh, this was one of them, not a fair trial. So what was Luciano's reaction to all of this? Was he confident in his his chances or was he nervous? It, It seems that he was confident, but he was not somebody who was known for betraying his feelings. He was known as a, 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 a person who was uh, impassive, who who was uh, seemed on the surface to be very relaxed, and um, police psychologists um, categorized him as seeming to not have a conscience or seeming to be almost childlike in his uh, faith that things would work out for himself. He tried some jokes on the witness stand that, fe- that he went on the witness stand. And he tried to, to tell jokes, and they fell flat. So uh, it seems like it might have it might have hit him by surprise. The verdict, ninety nine times guilty, and all that. Yeah. What was the defense's strategy in all of this? Was it just obvious to them to, that the prosecution didn't have anything hard on him? The defense was actually very impressive. Moses Polakoff was a a well-known criminal lawyer of the of the era he he represented Maya Lansky he was a highly respected criminal lawyer he and his team were involved in a more or less cross-examination of witnesses putting Charles Luciano on the trial uh, on the I'm sorry putting Charles Luciano on the witness stand 
uh, to question him about his whereabouts and his uh, his his whereabouts and his activities during that time frame. Like their strategy, if you even want to call it that, was to pin the pin him with gambling rather than with prostitution. So they tried to establish that he was at the racetrack, that he was in Florida at the racetrack. They had a racetrack in Jamaica, Queens in those days. Um, The whole idea was to establish that, number one, he was a gambler and not a, a pimp. And uh, number two, that he, uh, he, his famous line was, you know, I, I never gave, I, um, you know, I never, uh, I never gave to prostitutes, and, uh, you know, he, that he had um, female companions. They tried to distance him from the, from the social implications of prostitution, rather than trying to distance him from the legal implications. And it, it didn't work. It didn't work. There, there was also a talk of trying to um, get to jurors. They, uh, they actually did try to get to a juror and pay off a juror, and uh, there was quite a bit of that going on with um, ju- people on the jury uh, leaving and being replaced and... Uh, so the, the trial kind of got out of control, and uh, they also had to contend with the, these women who were going on the witness stand and who one after another were saying that they'd heard of him, that they'd heard his name mentioned. And there was one witness that they had to contend with, Nancy Presser, who actually claimed that she was in his hotel room, that she was his girlfriend, that she had heard things said and saw people come in. And uh, she was probably lying about all of that because he wouldn't have been going out with somebody like her, a drug addict. And he had he he was with showgirls. He was he was with fancy ladies, uh, ladies who were in the the newspapers, not low level drug addict prostitutes. So she was lying. So what were the actual charges against him? The charge was called compulsory prostitution. Impulsory Which prostitution, was okay. Also played on the whole concept of the Man Act, which was still being used in those days um to um can to get people that the law couldn't get any other way. There was that um African American boxer named Jim Johnson who was convicted on a Man Act charge because he was um, living with a white woman, and they crossed a state line. So when they when they referred to it as compulsory prostitution, it called to mind a phrase that frightened people in those days, and that phrase was white slavery. I mean, I remember my my grandmother not being allowed to to go out or do things because her mother would say, "Well, you have to be careful of white slavery." <laughs> You know, there really was a fear in this country in those days of girls being kidnapped and uh, sold into white slavery, which was a polite term for prostitution. But using the term compulsory like that made it sound so much dirtier. Right, exactly. So, So you already mentioned the verdict. How long did the jury deliberate? It it didn't deliberate for very long. There was no real issue with it. It was an all male jury made up of New York uh, residents of New York City, and uh, there isn't a lot of information that I ever found on the names of the people in the jury, or or maybe I'd seen a list, but uh, it wasn't publicized. Their names weren't publicized. They were actually probably in a, in a lot of danger. You know, for, for ruling on somebody like him like that. Uh, after the verdict, he was taken immediately to Sing Sing in the company of the other convicted co-defendants. And from there, he was sent to Danamora. So it all moved very quickly while he was filing appeals. Um, but nothing, nothing came of the appeals process. <laughs> 
that was quite a victory for Dewey. It was a victory for Dewey, and not only for him, the people who served on his um, district attorney staff all made names for themselves. Um, Frank Hogan, who um, uh, New Yorkers are familiar with that name, he was district attorney in New York City for decades, and uh, Murray Gerfine, a lot of the um, names that are associated with that trial are people who stayed in uh, New York state politics and um, and um, the prosecutor's office for years and years into the 40s and 50s. So it was, it was, it was a victory for them. How long did Luciano spend in prison and what was his time like there? He stayed in prison until 1944, right? He was, um, his time was, uh, his record was clean. There, what is written about his uh, time in Danamora was that he did hang out with little Davy Batillo, who was one of the lieutenants who, who ran the prostitution bonding combination, that little Davy Batillo uh, was his cook, cooked for him, and uh, that his time was clean, that there was no um, no blots on his record. But a famous warden once said, when asked who was the gangster he feared the most, he said, well, he said, not Al Capone, because Al Capone was just a fat slob. He said, he said but lucky Luciano, I would fear him. I'm sure we all remember the scene from Goodfellas where they're in prison, slicing the garlic with the razor blade. Right. But the- <laughs> was this an easy sentence for him to serve? Was it, Was he treated well? Well, it sounds like he probably had some privileges if... Um, Little Davy Batillo was his cook, but there isn't any official record that I've ever seen of exactly how his time went down. You know, so I mean, I guess they're not going to they're not going to put that in his prison record or uh anything like that. So, you know, you really can't go by anything solid just um surmising of that, you know, because he had somebody cooking for him, because his record was written up as being clean, and then he was uh, he was uh, released. His sentence was commuted uh, about eight years later. So that's what we have to go on. Sure. So how did this trial affect prostitution in the city? I mean, people were reading about it in the newspaper every day. What was the exposure? Positive or negative for the industry? The exposure was actually, I guess, New Yorkers were jaded even then. And um, there were letters written to the the New York Daily News, Voice of the People, uh, to the effect of, uh, so listen, if they think this is a problem, let's establish a red light district and, uh, and move on. You know, like, what's the big deal? And uh, the, the prostitution industry, of course, flourished after that. One of the bookers who was um, named in the trial, Pete Balitza, was rearrested in 1941. And um, New York Daily com has uh, photographs of prostitutes being rounded up and um, put into vans and paddy wagons, as they're commonly known as, uh, I guess, uh, in movies and stuff, paddy wagons being rounded up in the late 30s and early 40s. So nothing actually changed. I mean, th- they went after certain people and busted them down. Like Polly Adler was uh, a notorious madam who was uh, not involved with the bonding combination. She had a lot of power in her own right because she knew a lot of people, a lot of mobsters, and she was left alone. But uh, she was busted down by the, the late 1930s. She wasn't acting um, in prostitution anymore. I mean, I think they, they could bust down individual people or individual groups, but they weren't going to knock it out. And I don't think that was what was ever intended with the trial of Lucky Luciano. I think what was intended there was just a vehicle to get to get Charlie Lucky. And once he left 
the void left, what was it filled by Meyer Lansky? The void that he left was taken over for a time by Vito Genovese, and it's um, it's pretty common knowledge that Frank Costello, another mobster who was um, known to some people through um, television, like he was a uh, the gravelly voiced guy in the Kefava hearings who wouldn't let his face be photographed, just his hands. Some people remember that. He was uh, behind the scenes quite a bit running the enterprise for Luciana while he was in prison. So um, while Genovese more or less did not remain an ally, uh, people like Frank Costello and Maya Lansky always remained his allies. Interesting. So what do you think about all of this after your research? Is there any doubt in your mind that he was involved in prostitution? That's an interesting question to ask me because I've experienced a lot of frustration. My feeling is that he, and it's an opinion shared by other gangster researchers whose opinions I respect, he was probably getting a piece because... (laughs) No pun intended. Ooh. He was probably getting a <laughs> He was probably <laughs> That is funny. He was probably getting a piece of the profits um because uh Tommy the Bull Panaccio and little Davy Bertillo were two lieutenants in the same crime family um headed by him. So obviously he was getting a kickback on the prostitution, it wouldn't have operated without a skim going to the boss. But did he run it? Did he have anything to do with it other than that? I don't believe so, no. And a lot of uh, true crime researchers that I've spoken to or written to share that feeling that there was um, the skim that went to him, but that he did not run it. And, uh, you know, I think my frustration comes from the fact that I think Luciana will forever be linked with prostitution. He'll forever be linked with vice. I mean, any time you see any movies or Boardwalk Empire or anything else, he's always like in some parlor with like, (laughs) you know, women all around him. And it just, it seems to me that the historical or the true Luciano is is lost in that stereotype because he was so much more than that. Right. Can can you give us just a brief little history of what happened to Luciano after he got out of prison? His commutation occurred actually by the same person who got him convicted in the first place, Thomas E. Dewey, signed his commutation papers with the provision that he be deported. He was considered to have helped the war effort. At the time, World War II was um, going on, and uh, New York City became very paranoid when a ship was uh, caught fire. A warship called the the Normandy caught fire in New York Harbor and uh, capsized, and um, it was considered to be an act of sabotage, although there's evidence that points to the fact that it was just the mistake of a crew member. But uh, to this day, a lot of people believe the Normandy was an act of sabotage. Allegedly, this started the U.S. Navy's idea that they could get some mobsters on their side to protect the waterfront of New York City because um, Lucky Luciano was um, aligned with a man named Sox Lanza, L-A-N-Z-A, who ran the Fulton Fish Market. Uh, Visitors to New York City who will go to the Fulton Street Seaport may not know that at one time it was the Fulton Fish Market and all the the fish came through there and it was run by organized crime. So uh, Sox Lanza got the word out to protect the waterfront and everybody on there had to keep their eyes and ears open and watch for Germans, (laughs) watch for German saboteurs. And um, just as an aside, there was a mob um, 
war effort even before that, where Meyer Lansky was um, an avowed enemy of what was called the Bund, the neo-Nazi party in uh, in the United States where, that were having meetings and all. He, uh, Fritz Klum, uh, led by Fritz Klum, uh, Meyer Lansky, <laughs> they'd bust up the meetings. So they, they were their own little rogue uh, army of um, anti-Nazi uh, raiders in New York City under Maya Lansky. So, yeah, I actually did an episode on this with Arnie Bernstein called Swastika Nation. Oh, that sounds interesting. I'll I'll have to get that book title. Yes. Yeah, yeah, it's great. So uh, that sounds good. So, um, you know, Luciano, there was a, allegedly a twofold um, campaign. He would also send the word to Sicily, to the, the mob in Sicily, a Don Calo in Sicily to allow the Allied invaders in without a hitch. Now, there's always two sides to these stories. Uh, Luciano allegedly later said that he just told his, when his appeal failed by 1938 and he knew he wasn't getting out of jail free, he had his attorney's dig up all the dirt that they could find, and he said, on a certain someone associated with the uh, <laughs> with the trial. And uh, when this certain someone was presented with the dirt, they said, okay, <laughs> we'll, we'll let him out. We'll deport him. We'll get him out of here. And, uh, you know, it's funny. I tend to believe that that could have been true because of what we, the things we're hearing about today, about the things we're hearing about people that were never supposed to ever be revealed, you know. So maybe that's what happened. But um, with Luciano, unfortunately for us geeks, researchers, there's always two sort stories, two sides. So it's very hard to know exactly what happened. So one thing we know, he was deported to Italy, he went through Palermo, and um, immediately tried to get back in here. In 1947, he was back in Cuba by way of South America. And um, I don't know, some people believe that Frank Sinatra entertained him and the, um, the boys in the Hotel Nacional in Cuba before it was taken over by Castro, when it was still a gangster paradise. He wanted to, um, I was going to say he wanted a piece of, but I'm afraid to say <laughs> He wanted a piece of the, uh, the, nation, <laughs> of the, the Casino Nacional. There was gambling in Cuba in the 1940s. And, you know, Americans who today go to Vegas, and well, they used to go to Cuba. To, to play and ha and party and uh, revel and uh, so he wanted that and he was in Cuba with Maya Lansky and um, uh, allegedly Frank Sinatra and uh, to entertain them and um, that's where the death sentence for Bugsy Siegel was signed because um, they felt that he was mismanaging his hotel that he was building in Las Vegas the Flamingo Hotel. So they uh, signed the death sentence on Bugsy Siegel, that among other things. Now, when it got back, there was a reporter in Cuba. Somehow it got back to the United States government that he was there, and the United States government immediately uh, threatened to stop the shipment of legal pharmaceuticals to Cuba unless and until... Lucky Luciano was uh, kicked out of the country and sent back to Italy. So he was uh, taken to a detention center, uh, an immigration detention center in Cuba, and then sent back to Italy and never returned to the United States. I mean, there are stories. I've got emails of people claimed he came back disguised as a woman in a wheelchair and People have sent me these emails, but uh, there's no proof of that. There's no proof that he ever came back to the United States until he died and his body was brought back here. Um, in terms of what he did in Italy, that too. It's um, there's the whole books have been written about his involvement in the in international narcotics. 
And as much as the Italian government tried and tried over the years to find out whatever he might have been involved in, he always kept his nose clean. They never found out anything. He had he had a source of income. He he had some sort of private business machinery or something that was he sold, but um, he lived well without any, uh, I guess, definable source of income. I guess it'll remain a mystery until someone solves it, right? I think with all the research that's been done and all the books that have been written at this point, and they still haven't, I don't know if they ever will. Well, this has been great. Thanks so much for taking time out of your day to do this with me again. Oh, thank you so much for wanting to uh, to talk, and uh, I hope that I was able to shed some light on this mysterious man's uh, life and times. Absolutely. And again, your book is called The Case Against Lucky Luciano, New York's Most Sensational Vice Trial, available at bookstores, barnesandnoble.com, amazon.com. It's available on Amazon.com. I know that. Okay, perfect. Well, thanks so much, Ellen. I appreciate it. Okay. Thank you so much, Eric. This has been another episode of the Most Notorious Podcast, broadcasting to every dark and cobwebbed corner of the world. I'm Eric Rivenis, and have a safe tomorrow. 